Chapter Nine of A Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Rose and Its Thorn. Dawn found the ranch astir with a heavy fog hanging over the Frio Valley. Don Pierre had a remuda corralled before sunup and insisted on our riding his horses, an invitation which my employer alone declined. For the first hour or two the pack scouted the river bottoms with no success, and Uncle Lance's verdict was that the valley was too soggy for any animal belonging to the cat family. So we turned back to the divide between the Frio and San Miguel. Here there grew, among the hills, many Guajaro thickets, and from the first one we beat the hounds opened on a hot trail in splendid chorus. The pack led us through the thicket for over a mile, when they suddenly turned down a ravine, heading for the river. With the ground in splendid condition for trailing, the dogs in full cry, the quarry sought every shelter possible. But within an hour of striking the scent, the pack came to bay in the Ensenal. On coming up with the hounds, we found the animal was a large catamount. A single shot brought him from his perch in a scraggly oak, and the first chase of the day was over. The pelt was worthless and was not taken. It was nearly noon when the kill was made, and Don Pierre insisted that we return to the ranch. Uncle Lance protested against wasting the remainder of the day, but the courteous Creole urged that the ground would be in fine condition for hunting at least a week longer. This hunt, he declared, was merely preliminary, to break the pack together and give them a taste of the chase before attacking the cougar. Ah, said Don Pierre, with a deprecating shrug of the shoulders, you have nothing to hurry you home. I come by your ranchero and stay for one whole week. You come by mine, all time hurry. Sacre, let the little dogs rest. And in the morning, maybe we hunt the cougar. Ah, Mr. Lance, we must have the pack fresh for him. By gar, he was one damn wild fellow. Make one, two pass, so, biff, two dogs dead. Uncle Lance yielded, and we rode back to the ranch. The next morning our party included the three daughters of our host. Don Pierre led the way on a roan stallion, and after two hours riding we crossed the San Miguel to the north of his ranch. A few miles beyond we entered some chalky hills, interspersed with white chaparral thickets which were just bursting into bloom, with a fragrance that was almost intoxicating. Under the direction of our host, we started to beat a long chain of these thickets and were shortly rewarded by hearing the pack give mouth. The quarry kept to the cover of the thickets for several miles, impeding the chase until the last covert in the chain was reached, where a fight occurred with the lead hound. Don Pierre was the first to reach the scene, and caught several glimpses of a monster puma as he slunk away through the Brazil brush, leaving one of the Don's favorite hounds lacerated to the bone. But the pack passed on, and lifting the wounded dog to a vaquero's saddle, we followed, lustily shouting to the hounds. The spore now turned down to San Miguel, and the pace was such that it took hard riding to keep within hearing. Mr. Vox and Uncle Lance usually held the lead, the remainder of the party, including the girls, bringing up the rear. The chase continued downstream for fully an hour until we encountered some heavy timber on the main frio, our course having carried us several miles to the north of the McLeod Ranch. Some distance below the juncture with the San Miguel, the river made a large horseshoe, embracing nearly a thousand acres, which was covered with a dense growth of ash, pecan, and cypress. The trail led into this jungle, circling it several times before leading away. We were fortunately able to keep track of the chase from the baying of the hounds, without entering the timber, and were watching its course when suddenly it changed. The pack followed the scent across the bridge of driftwood on the Frio, and started up the river in full cry. 
As the chase down the San Miguel passed beyond the mouth of the creek, Theodore Quayle and Francis Vox dropped out and rode for the McLeod Ranch. It was still early in the day, and understanding their motive, I knew they would rejoin us if their mission was successful. By the sudden turn of the chase, we were likely to pass several miles south of the home of my sweetheart. But our location could be easily followed by the music of the pack. Within an hour after leaving us, Theodore and Francis rejoined the chase, adding Tony Hunter and Esther to our numbers. With this addition, I lost interest in the hunt, as the course carried us straight away five miles up the stream. The quarry was cunning, and delayed the pack at every thicket or large body of timber encountered. Several times he craftily attempted to throw the hounds off the scent by climbing leaning trees, only to spring down again. But the pack were running wide, and a ruse was only tiring the hunted. The scent at times left the river and circled through outlying mesquite groves, always keeping well under cover. On these occasions we rested our horses, for the hunt was certain to return to the river. From the scattering order in which we rode, I was afforded a good opportunity for free conversation with Esther, but the information I obtained was not very encouraging. Her mother's authority had grown so severe that existing under the same roof was a mere armistice between mother and daughter while this day's sport was likely to break the already strained relations. The thought that her suffering was largely on my account nerved me to resolution. The kill was made late in the day, in a bend of the river about fifteen miles above the Vox Ranch, forming a jungle of several thousand acres. In this thickly covert, the fugitive made his final stand, taking refuge in an immense old live oak. The mossy tunes of which partially screened him from view. The larger portion of the cavalcade remained in the open, but the rest of us, under the leadership of the two rancheros, forced our horses through the underbrush and reached the hounds. The pack were as good as exhausted by the long run, and lest the animal should spring out of the tree and escape, we circled it at a distance. On catching a fair view of the quarry, Uncle Lance called for a carbine. Two shots through the shoulder served to loosen the puma's footing, when he came down by easy stages from limb to limb, spitting and hissing defiance in the upturned faces of the pack. As he fell, we dashed in to beat off the dogs as a matter of precaution, but the bullets had done their work, and the pack mouthed the fallen feline with entire impunity. Dan Happersat dragged the dead puma out with a rope over the neck for the inspection of the girls, while our horses, which had had no less than a fifty-mile ride, were unsaddled and allowed a roll and a half-hour's graze before starting back. As we were watering our mounts, I caught my employer's ear long enough to repeat what I had learned about Esther's home difficulties. After picketing our horses, we strolled away from the remainder of the party. When Uncle Lance remarked, Tom, your chance has come where you must play your hand and play it boldly. I'll keep Tony at the Vox Ranch, and if Esther has to go home tonight, why, of course, you'll have to take her. There's your chance to run off and marry. Now, Tom, you've never failed me yet, and this thing has gone far enough. We'll give old Lady McLeod good cause to hate us from now on. I've got some money with me and I'll rob the other boys, and tonight you make a spoon or spoil a horn. Sabe? I understood and approved. As we jogged along homeward, Esther and I fell to the rear, and I outlined my program. Nor did she protest when I suggested that tonight was the accepted time. Before we reached the Vox Ranch, every little detail was arranged. There was a splendid moon, and after supper, she pleaded the necessity of returning home. Meanwhile, every cent my friends possessed had been given me, and the two best horses of Las Palomas were under saddle for the start. Uncle Lance was arranging a big hunt for the morrow, with Tony Hunter 
and Don Pierre, when Esther took leave of her friends, only a few of whom were cognizant of our intended elopement. With fresh mounts under us, we soon covered the intervening distance between the two ranches. I would gladly have waved touching at the McLeod ranch, but Esther had torn her dress during the day and insisted on a change, and I, of necessity, yielded. The corrals were at some distance from the main buildings, and halting at a saddle shed adjoining, Esther left me and entered the house. Fortunately, her mother had retired, and after making a hasty change of apparel, she returned unobserved to the corrals. As we quietly rode out from the enclosure, my spirits soared to the moon above us. The night was an ideal one. Crossing the Frio, we followed the divide some distance, keeping in the open, and an hour before midnight forded the Nueces at Shepherd's. A flood of recollections crossed my mind, as our steaming horses bent their heads to drink at the ferry. Less than a year before, in this very grove, I had met her. It was but two months since, on those hills beyond, we had gathered flowers, plighted our troth, and exchanged our first rapturous kiss and the thought that she was renouncing home and all for my sake softened my heart and nerved me to every exertion. Our intention was to intercept the southbound stage at the first roadhouse south of Oakville. I knew the hour it was due to leave the station, and by steady riding we could connect with it at the first stage stand some fifteen miles below. Light-hearted and happy, we set out on this last lap of our ride. Our horses seemed to understand the emergency as they put the miles behind them, thrilling us with their energy and vigor. Never for a moment in our flight did my sweetheart discover a single qualm over her decision, while in my case all scruples were buried in the hope of victory. Recrossing the Nueces and entering the stage road, we followed it down several miles, sighting the stage stand about two o'clock in the morning. I was saddle-weary from the hunt, together with his fifty-mile ride, and rejoiced in reaching our temporary destination. Esther, however, seemed a little the worse for the long ride. The welcome extended by the keeper of this relay station was gruff enough, but his tone and manner moderated when he learned that we were passengers for Corpus Christi. When I made arrangements with him to look after our horses for a week or ten days, at a handsome figure, he became amiable, invited us to a cup of coffee, and politely informed us that the stage was due in half an hour. But on its arrival, promptly on time, our hearts sank within us. On the driver's box sat an express guard, holding across his knees a sawed-off, double-barreled shotgun. As it halted, two other guards stepped out of the coach, similarly armed. The stage was carrying an unusual amount of treasure, we were informed, and no passengers could be accepted, as an attempted robbery was expected between this and the next station. Our situation became embarrassing. For the first time during our ride, Esther showed the timidity of her sex. The chosen destination of our honeymoon, nearly a hundred miles to the south, was now out of the question. To return to Oakville, where a sister and friends of my sweetheart resided, seemed the only avenue open. I had misgivings that it was unsafe. But Esther urged it, declaring that Mrs. Martin would offer no opposition, and even if she did, nothing could come that would ever separate us. We learned from the keeper that Jack Martin was due to drive the northbound stage out of Oakville that morning and was expected to pass this relay station about daybreak. This was favorable, and we decided to wait and allow the stage to pass north before resuming our journey. On the arrival of the stage, we learned that the down coach had been attacked, but the robbers, finding it guarded, had fled after an exchange of shots in the darkness. This had a further depressing effect on my betrothed, and only my encouragement to be brave and faced the dilemma confronting us, kept her up. Bred on the frontier, this little ranch girl was no weakling, but the sudden overturn of her well-laid plans 
had chilled my own spirits as well as hers. Giving the upstage a good start of us, we resaddled and started off for Oakville, slightly crestfallen but still confident. In the open air, Esther's fears gradually subsided, and invigorated by the morning and the gallop, we reached our destination after our night's adventure with hopes buoyant and colors flying. Mrs. Martin looked a trifle dumbfounded at her early callers, but I lost no time in informing her that our mission was an elopement and asked her approval and blessing. Surprised as she was, she welcomed us to breakfast, inquiring of our plans and showing alarm over our experience. Since Oakville was a county seat where a license could be secured, for fear of pursuit, I urged an immediate marriage, but Mrs. Martin could see no necessity for haste. There was, she said, no one there whom she would allow to solemnize a wedding of her sister, and to my chagrin, Esther agreed with her. This was just what I had dreaded, but Mrs. Martin, with apparent enthusiasm over our union, took the reins in her own hands and decided that we should wait until Jack's return, when we would all take the stage to Pleasanton, where an Episcopal minister lived. My heart sank at this, for it meant a delay of two days, and I stood up and stoutly protested. But now that the excitement of our flight had abated, my own Esther innocently sided with her sister, and I was at my wit's end. To all my appeals, the sisters replied with the argument that there was no hurry, that while the hunt lasted at the Vox Ranch, Tony Hunter could be depended upon to follow the hounds. Esther would never be missed until his return. Her mother would suppose she was with the Vox girls, and would be busy preparing a lecture against her return. Of course the argument of the sisters won the hour. Though dreading some unforeseen danger, I temporarily yielded. I knew the motive of the hunt well enough to know that the moment we had an ample start it would be abandoned, and the Las Palomas contingent would return to the ranch. Yet I dare not tell, even my betrothed, that there were ulterior motives in my employers hunting on the Frio, one of which was to afford an opportunity for our elopement. Full of apprehension and alarm, I took a room at the village hostelry, for I had our horses to look after, and secured a much-needed sleep during the afternoon. That evening I returned to the Martin Cottage, to urge again that we carry out our original program by taking the southbound stage at midnight. But all I could say was of no avail. Mrs. Martin was equal to every suggestion. She had all the plans outlined, and there was no occasion for me to do any thinking at all. Corpus Christi was not to be considered for a single moment, compared to Pleasanton and an Episcopalian service. What could I do? At an early hour, Mrs. Martin withdrew. The reaction from our escapade had left the pallor on my sweetheart's countenance. Almost alarming. Noticing this, I took my leave early hoping that a good night's rest would restore her color and her spirits. Returning to the hostelry, I resignedly sought my room, since there was nothing I could do but wait. Tossing and pitching on my bed, I unbraided myself for having returned to Oakville, where any interference with our plans could possibly develop. The next morning at breakfast I noticed that I was the object of particular attention, and of no very kindly sort. No one even gave me a friendly nod, while several avoided my glances. Supposing that some rumor of our elopement might be abroad, I hurriedly finished my meal and started for the Martins. On reaching the door, I was met by its mistress, who, I had need to remind myself, was the sister of my betrothed. To my friendly salutation, she gave me a scornful, withering look. "'You're too late, young man,' she said. "'Shortly after you left last night, Esther and Jack Oxenford took a private conveyance for Beeville, and are married before this. You Las Palomas people are slow. Old Lance Lovelace thought he was playing at cute San Jacinto Day, 
but I saw through his little game. Somebody must have told him he was a matchmaker. Well, just give him my regards and tell him that he don't know the first principles of that little game. Tell him to drop in some time when he's passing. I may be able to give him some pointers that I'm not using at the moment. I hope your sorrow will not exceed my happiness. Good morning, sir. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of a Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Aftermath. My memory of what happened immediately after Mrs. Martin's contemptuous treatment of me is as vague and indefinite as the vaporings of a fevered dream. I had a faint recollection of several friendly people offering their sympathy. The old stableman, who looked after the horses, cautioned me not to start out alone. But I have since learned that I cursed him and all the rest, and rode away as one in a trance. But I must have had some little caution left, for I remember giving shepherds a wide berth, passing several miles to the south. The horses, taking their own way, were wandering home. Any exercise of control or guidance over them on my part was inspired by an instinct to avoid being seen. Of conscious direction there was none. Somewhere between the ferry and the ranch I remember being awakened from my toper by the horse which I was leading, showing an inclination to graze. Then I noticed their gaunt condition, and in sympathy for the poor brutes, unsaddled and picketed them in a secluded spot. What happened at this halt has slipped from my memory, but I must have slept a long time, for I awoke to find the moon high overhead, and my watch through neglect run down and stopped. I now realized the better my predicament, and reasoned with myself whether I should return to Las Palomas or not. But there was no place else to go, and the horses did not belong to me. If I could only reach the ranch and secure my own horse, I felt that no power on earth could chain me to the scenes of my humiliation. The horses decided me to return. Resaddling at an unknown hour, I rode for the ranch. The animals were refreshed and made good time. As I rode along, I tried to convince myself that I could slip into the ranch, secure my own saddle horse, and meet no one except the Mexicans. There was a possibility that Deweese might still be in camp at the new reservoir, and I was hopeful that my employer might not yet be returned from the hunt on the Frio. After a number of hours riding, a horse under saddle nickered. Halting him, I listened, and heard the roosters crowing in a chorus at the ranch. Clouds had obscured the moon, and so by making a detour around the home buildings, I was able to reach the Mexican quarters unobserved. I rode up to the house of Enrique and quietly aroused him, told him my misfortune, and asked him to hide me until he could get my horse. We turned the animals loose, and, taking my saddle inside, the Wacow held a whispered conversation. Deweese was yet at the tank. If the hunting party had returned, they had done so during the night. The distant range of my horse made it impossible to get him before the middle of the forenoon, but Enrique and Donna Anita assured me that my slightest wish was law to them. Furnishing me with a blanket and pillow, they made me a couch on a dry cowskin on the dirt floor at the foot of their bed, and before day broke I had fallen asleep. On awakening I found the sun had already risen. Enrique and his wife were missing from the room, but a peep through a crevice in the palisade wall revealed Donna Anita in the kitchen adjoining. She had detected my awakening and soon brought me a cup of splendid coffee, which I drank with relish. She urged on me also some dainty dishes, which had always been favorites with me in Mexican cookery. But my appetite was gone. Throwing myself back on the cowskin, I asked Donna Anita 
how long Enrique had been gone in quest for my horse, and was informed that he left before dawn, not even waiting for his customary cup of coffee. With the kindness of a sister, the girl-wife urged me to take their bed, but I assured her that comfort was the least of my concerns, complete effacement being my consuming thought. Donna Anita withdrew, and as I lay pondering over the several possible routes of escape, I heard a commotion in the ranch. I was in the act of rising when Donna Anita burst into the jacal to tell me that Don Lance had been sighted returning. I was on my feet in an instant, heard the long-drawn notes of the horn calling in the hounds, and peering through the largest crack, saw the cavalcade. As they approached, driving their loose mounts in front of them, I felt my ill luck still hung over me, for among the unsaddled horses were the two which I had turned free but a few hours before. The hunters had met the gaunted animals between the ranch and the river, and were bringing them in to return them to their own remuda. But at the same time the horses were evidence that I was in the ranch. From the position of Uncle Lance in advance, I could see that he was riding direct to the house, and my absence there would surely cause surprise. At best it was but a question of time until I was discovered. In the face of this new development I gave up. There was no escaping fate. Enrique might not return for two hours yet, and if he came, driving in my horse, it would only prove my presence. I begged Donna Anita to throw open the door and conceal nothing, but she was still ready to aid in my concealment until night, offering to deny my presence. But how could I conceal myself in a single room? And what was so simple a device to a worldly man of sixty years' experience? To me, the case looked hopeless. Even before we had concluded our discussion, I saw Uncle Lance and the boys coming towards the Mexican quarters, followed by Miss Jean and the household contingent. The fact that the door of Enrique's jacal was closed made it a shining mark for investigation. Opening the inner door, I started to meet the visitors, but Donna Anita planted herself at the outer entrance of the stoop, met the visitors, and within my hearing and without being asked, stoutly denied my presence. "'Hush up, you little liar,' said a voice, and I heard a step and clanking spurs which I recognized. I sat down on the edge of the bed, and was rolling a cigarette as the crowd filed into the jacal. A fortunate flush of anger came over me, which served to steady my voice, but I met their staring, after all, much as if I had been a culprit and they a vigilante committee. "'Well, young fellow, explain your presence here,' demanded Uncle Lance. Had it not been for the presence of Miss Jean, I had on my tongue's end a reply relative to the Eleventh Commandment, emphasized with so furious adjectives. But out of deference to the mistress of the ranch, I controlled my anger, and taking out of my pocket a flint of steel and a bit of yesca, struck fire and leisurely lighted my cigarette. Throwing myself back on the bed, as my employer repeated his demand, I replied, Ask Anita. The girl understood, and, nothing abashed, told the story in her native tongue, continually referring to me as pobre Tomas. When her disconnected narrative was concluded, Uncle Lance turned on me, saying, And this is the result of all our plans. You went into Oakville, did you? Tom, you haven't got as much sense as a candy frog. Walked right into a trap with your head up and sassy. That's right. Don't you listen to anyone. Didn't I tell you that stage people would stick by each other like thieves? And you forgot all my warnings and deliberately? Hold on, I interrupted. You must recollect that the horses had had a fifty-mile forced ride, were jaded, and on the point of collapse. With the down stage refusing to carry us, and the girl on the point of hysteria, where else could I go? Go to jail if necessary. Go anywhere but the place you went. The horses were jaded on a fifty-mile ride, were they? 
Either one of them was good for a hundred without unsaddling, and you know it. Haven't I told you that this ranch would raise horses when we were all dead and gone? Suppose you had killed a couple of horses. What would that have been compared to your sneaking into the ranch this way, like a whipped cur with your tail between your legs? Now the countryside will laugh at us both. The country may laugh, I answered, but I'll not be here to hear it. Enrique has gone after my horse, and as soon as he gets in, I'm leaving you for good. You'll do nothing of the kind. You think you're all shot to pieces, don't you? Well, you'll stay right here until all your wounds heal. I've taken all these degrees myself, and have lived to laugh at them afterward. And I've had lessons that I hope you'll never have to learn. When I found out that my third wife had known a gambler before she married me, I found out what the Bible means by rottenness of the bones, with which it says an evil woman uncrowns her husband. I'll tell you about it some day, but you've not been scarred in this little side play. You're not even powder burnt. Why, in less than a month, you'll be just as happy again as if you had good sense. Miss Jean now interrupted. Clear right out of here, she said to her brother and the rest. Yes, the whole pack of you. I want to talk with Tom alone. Yes, you too. You've said too much already. Run along, out. As they filed out, I noticed Uncle Lance pick up my saddle and throw it across his shoulder, while Theodore gathered up the rancid blankets and my fancy bridle, taking everything with them to the house. Waiting until she saw her orders were obeyed, Miss Jean came over and sat down beside me on the bed. Anita stood like a fawn near the door, likewise fearing banishment. But on a sign from her mistress, she spread a goatskin on the floor and sat down at our feet. Between two languages and two women, I was as helpless as an ironed prisoner. Not that Anita had any influence over me, but the mistress of the ranch had. In her hands, I was as helpless as a baby. I had come to the ranch a stranger only a little over a year before, but had I been born there, her interest could have been no stronger. Jean Lovelace relinquished no one any more than a mother would one of her boys. I wanted to escape to get away from observation. I even pled for a month's leave of absence but my reasons were of no avail, and after arguing pro and con for over an hour, I went with her to the house. If the Almighty ever made a good woman, and placed her among men for their betterment, then the presence of Jean Lovelace at Las Palomas savored of divine appointment. On reaching the yard, we rested a long time on a set tea under a group of china trees. The boys had dispersed, and after quite a friendly chat together, we saw Uncle Lance sauntering out of the house, smiling as he approached. "'Tom's going to stay,' said Miss Jean to her brother, as the latter seated himself beside us. "'But this abuse and blame you're heaping upon him must stop. He did what he thought was best under the circumstances, and you don't know what they were. He has given me his promise to stay, and I have given him mine, that talk about this matter will be dropped. Now that your anger is cooled, and I have you both together, I want your word. Tom, said my employer, throwing his long, bony arm around me. I was disappointed, terribly put out, and I showed it in freeing my mind. But I feel better now, towards you at least. I understand just how you felt when your plans were thwarted by an unforeseen incident. If I don't know everything, then, since the milk is spilt, I'm not asking for further particulars. If you did what you thought was best under the circumstances, why, that's all we ever ask of anyone at Las Palomas. A mistake is nothing. My whole life is a series of errors. I've been trying, and expect to keep right on trying, to give you youngsters the benefit of my years. But if you insist on learning it for yourselves, well enough. When I was your age, I took no one's advice. But look how I've paid the fiddler. Possibly it was ordained otherwise. 
but it looks to me like a shame that I can't give you boys the benefit of my dearly bought experience. But whether you take my advice or not, we're going to be just as good friends as ever. I need young fellows like you on this ranch. I've sent Dan out after DeWeese, and tomorrow we're going to commence gathering the beeves. A few weeks' good hard work will do you worlds of good. In less than a year, you'll look back at this as a splendid lesson. Shucks, boy, a man is a narrow, calloused creature until he has been shook up a few times by love affairs. They develop him into the man he was intended to be. Come on into the house, Tom, and Jean will make us a couple of mint juleps. What a blessed panacea for mental trouble is work. We were in the saddle by daybreak the next morning, rounding up remudas. Every available vaquero at the outlying ranchitas had been summoned. Dividing the outfit and horses, Uncle Lance took twelve men and struck west for the Ganso. With an equal number of men, DeWeese pushed north for the Frio, which he was to work down below Shepherd's, thence back along the home river. From the ranch books, we knew there were fully two thousand beeves over five years old in our brand. These cattle had never known hours' restraint since the day they were branded, and caution and cool judgment would be required in handling them. Since the contract only required twelve hundred, we expected to make an extra clean gathering, using the oldest and naturally the largest beeves. During the week spent in gathering, I got the full benefit of every possible hour in the saddle. We reached the Ganso about an hour before sundown. The weather had settled, water was plentiful, and everyone realized that the work in hand would require wider riding than under dry conditions. By the time we had caught up fresh horses, the sun had gone down. Boys, said Uncle Lance, we want to make a big rodeo on the head of this creek in the morning. Tom, you take two vaqueros and lay off to the southwest about ten miles, and make a dry camp tonight. Glenn may have the same help to the southeast, and every rascal of you be in your saddles by daybreak. There's a lot of big Ladino beeves in these bushy hills, to the south and west. Be sure and be in your saddles early enough to catch all wild cattle out on the prairies. If you want to, you can take a lunch in your pocket for breakfast. No, you'll need no blankets. You'll get up earlier if you sleep cold. Taking Jose Peña and Pascal Arispe with me, I struck off on our course in the gathering twilight. The first twitter of a bird in the morning brought me to my feet. I roused the others and we saddled, and were riding with the first sign of dawn in the east. Taking the outside circle myself, I gave every bunch of cattle met on my course a good start for the center of the roundup. Pascal and Jose followed several miles to my rear on inner circles, drifting on the cattle which I had started inward. As the sun arose, dispelling the morning mists, I could see other cattle coming down in long strings out of the hills to the eastward. Within an hour of starting, Gallup and I met. Our half-circle to the southward was perfect, and each turning back, we rode our appointed divisions until the vaqueros from the wagon were sighted, throwing in cattle and closing up the northern portion of the circle. Before the sun was two hours high, the first rodeo of the day was together, numbering about three thousand mixed cattle. In the few hours since dawn, we had concentrated all animals in a territory at least fifteen miles in diameter. Uncle Lance was in his element, detailing two vaqueros to hold the beef cut within reach, and half a dozen to keep the main herd compact. He ordered the remainder of us to enter and begin the selecting of beeves. There were a number of big wild steers in the roundup, but we left those until the cut numbered over two hundred. When every hoof over five years of age was separated, we had a nucleus for our beef herd numbering about two hundred and forty steers. They were in fine condition for grass cattle, and turning the main herd free, 
we started our cut for the wagon, being compelled to ride wide of them as we drifted downstream towards camp, as there were a number of old beeves which showed impatience at the restraint. But by letting them scatter well, by the time they reached the wagon, it required but two vaqueros to hold them. The afternoon was but a repetition of the morning. Everything on the south side of the Nueces between the river and the wagon was thrown together on the second round-up of the day, which yielded less than two hundred cattle for our beef herd. But when we went into camp, dividing into squads for night herding, the day's work was satisfactory to the ranchero. Dan Happersat was given five vaqueros and stood the first watch or until 1 a.m. Glenn Gallup and myself took the remainder of the men and stood guard until morning. When Happersat called our guard an hour after midnight, he said to Gallup and me, as we were pulling on our boots, about a dozen big steers haven't laid down. There's only one of them that has given any trouble. He's a pinto that we cut in the first round-up in the morning. He has made two breaks already to get away. If you don't watch him close, he'll surely give you the slip. While riding to the relief, Glenn and I posted our vaqueros to be on the lookout for the pinto beef. The cattle were intentionally bedded loose. But even in the starlight and waning moon, every man easily spotted the Ladino beef, uneasily stalking back and forth like a caged tiger across the bed ground. A half hour before dawn, he made a final effort to escape, charging out between Gallop and the vaquero, following up on the same side. From the other side of the bed ground, I heard the commotion, but dare not leave the herd to assist. There was a mile of open country surrounding our camp, and if two men could not turn the beef on that space, it was useless for others to offer assistance. In the stillness of the morning hour, we could hear the running and see the flashes from the six-shooters, marking the course of the outlaw. After making a half-circle, we heard them coming direct for the herd. For fear of a stampede, we raised a great commotion around the sleeping cattle. But in spite of our precautions, as the Ladino beef re-entered the herd, over half the beeves jumped to their feet and began milling but we held them until dawn, and after scattering them over several hundred acres, left them grazing contentedly. When, leaving two vaqueros with a feeding herd, we went back to the wagon. The camp had been astir some time, and when Glenn reported the incident of our watch, Uncle Lance said, I thought I heard some shooting while I was catnapping at daylight. Well, we can use a little fresh beef in this very camp. We'll kill him at noon. The wagon will move down near the river this morning, so we can make three rodeos from it without moving camp, and tonight we'll have a side of Pinto's ribs barbecued. My mouth is watering this very minute for a rib roast. That morning after a big rodeo on the Nueces, well above the Ganso, we returned to camp, throwing into our herd the cut of less than a hundred secured on the morning round-up. Uncle Lance, who had preceded us, rode out from the wagon with a carbine. Allowing the beefs to scatter, the old ranchero met and rode zigzagging through them until he came face to face with a pinto ladino. On noticing the intruding horseman, the outlaw threw up his head. There was a carbine report, and the big fellow went down in his tracks. By the time the herd had grazed away, Fabrucio who was cooking with our wagon, brought out all the knives, and the beef was bled, dressed, and quartered. "'You can afford to be extravagant with this beef,' said Uncle Lance to the old cook, when the quarters had been carried into the wagon. "'I've been ranching on this river nearly forty years, and I've always made it a rule, where cattle cannot be safely handled, to beef them then and there. I've sat up many a night barbecuing the ribs of a ladino. If you have plenty of salt, Trebucio, you can make a brine and jerk those hind quarters. It will make fine chewing for the boys on night herd when once we start for the coast. 
Following down the home river, we made ten other rodeos before we met Deweese. We had something over a thousand beeves while he had less than eight hundred. Throwing the two cuts together, we made a count and cut back all the younger and smaller cattle until the herd was reduced to the required number. Before my advent at Las Palomas, about the only outlet for beef cattle had been the canneries at Rockport and Fulton, but these cattle were for shipment by boat to New Orleans and other coast cities. The route to the coast was well known to my employer, and detailing twelve men for the herd, a horse wrangler and cook extra, we started for it, barely touching at the ranch on our course. It was a nice ten days trip. After the first night, we used three guards of four men each. Grazing contentedly, the cattle quieted down until, on our arrival, half our number could have handled them. The herd was counted and received on the outlying prairies, and as no steamer was due for a few days, another outfit took charge of them. Uncle Lance was never much of a man for towns, and soon after settlement the next morning, we were ready to start home but the payment, amounting to thirty thousand dollars, presented a problem, as the bulk of it came to us in silver. There was scarcely a merchant in the place who had assumed the responsibility of receiving it even on deposit, and in the absence of a bank there was no alternative but to take it home. The agent for the steamship company solicited the money for transportation to New Orleans, mentioning the danger of robbery and referring to the recent attempt of bandits to hold up the San Antonio and Corpus Christi stage. I had good cause to remember that incident, and was wondering what my employer would do under the circumstances, when he turned from the agent, saying, "'Well, we'll take it home just the same. I have no use for money in New Orleans, nor do I care if every bandit in Texas knows we've got the money in the wagon.' I want to buy a few new guns, anyhow. If robbers tackle us, we'll promise them a warm reception. And I never knew a thief who didn't think more of his own carcass than of another man's money. The silver was loaded into the wagon and sacks, and we started on our return. It was rather a risky trip, but we never concealed the fact that we had every dollar of the money in the wagon. It would have been dangerous to make an attempt on us for we were all well armed. We reached the ranch in safety, rested a day, and then took the ambulance and went on to San Antonio. Three of us beside Trebusio accompanied our employer, each taking a saddle horse and stopping by night at ranches where we were known. On the third day we reached the city in good time to bank the money, much to my relief. As there was no work pressing at home, we spent a week in the city, thoroughly enjoying ourselves. Uncle Lance was negotiating for the purchase of a large Spanish land grant, which adjoined our range on the west, taking in the Gonzo and several miles frontage on both sides of the home river. This required his attention for a few days, during which time Deweese met two men on the lookout for stock cattle with which to start a new ranch on the Devil's River in Valverde County. They were in the market for 3,000 cows to be delivered that fall or the following spring. Our segundo promptly invited them to meet his employer that evening at our hotel. As the ranges in eastern Texas became of value for agriculture, the cowman moved westward, disposing of his cattle or taking them with him. It was men of this class whom Deweese had met during the day and on filling their appointment in the evening, our employer and the buyers soon came to an agreement. References were exchanged, and the next afternoon a contract was entered into whereby we were to deliver, May 1st, at Las Palomas Ranch, 3,000 cows between the ages of two and four years. There was some delay in perfecting the title to the land grant. We'll start home in the morning, boys, said Uncle Lance, the evening after the contract was drawn. You simply can't hurry a land deal. I'll get that tracked in time. But there's over a hundred heirs now of the original Don. I'd just like to know 
what the grandee did for his king to get that grant. Tickled his royal nibs, I reckon, with some cock and bull story. And here I had to give up nearly forty thousand dollars of good honest money. Twenty years ago I was offered the same grant for ten cents an acre, and now I'm paying four bits. But I didn't have the money then, and I'm not sure I'd have bought it if I had. But I need it now, and I need it bad, and that's why I'm letting them hold me up for such a figure. Stopping at the last chance roadhouse on the outskirts of the city the next morning for a final drink as we were leaving, Uncle Lance said to us over the cattle contract, There's money in it, good money, too, but we're not going to fill it out of our home brand. Not in this year of our Lord. I think too much of my cows to part with a single animal. Boys, cows made Las Palomas what she is, and as long as they win for me, I intend to swear by them through thick and thin, in good and bad repute, fair weather or foul. So, June, just as soon as the fall branding is over, you can take Tom with you for an interpreter and start for Mexico to contract these cows. Las Palomas is going to branch out and spread herself. As a ranchman, I can bring cows across for breeding purposes free of duty, and I know of no good reason why I can't change my mind and sell them. Dan, take Trebusio out a cigar. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of a Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Turkey Bake. Deweese and I came back from Mexico during Christmas week. On reaching Las Palomas, we found Frank Narcredi and Ed Tully, the latter being also a trail foreman at the ranch. They were wintering in San Antonio and were spending a few weeks at our ranch incidentally on the lookout for several hundred saddle horses for trail purposes the coming spring we had no horses for sale but nevertheless uncle lance had prevailed on them to make las palomas headquarters during their stay in the country the first night at the ranch miss jean and i talked until nearly midnight there had been so many happenings during my absence that it required a whole evening to tell them all from the naming of Anita's baby to the rivalry between John and Theodore for the favor of Francis Vaux, all the latest social news of the countryside was discussed. Miss Jean had attended the dance at Shepherd's during the fall, and had heard it whispered that Oxford and Esther were anything but happy. The latest word from the Vaux ranch said that the couple had separated. At least there was some trouble for when Oxenford had attempted to force her to return to Oakville and had made some disparaging remarks, Tony Hunter had crimped a six-shooter over his head. I pretended not to be interested in this, but secretly, had I learned that Hunter had killed Oxenford, I should have had no very serious regrets. Uncle Lance had promised Tully and Nancredi a turkey hunt during the holidays. So on our unexpected return it was decided to have it at once. There had been a heavy mast that year, and in the Ensignal ridges to the east wild turkeys were reported plentiful. Accordingly we set out the next afternoon for a camp hunt in some oak-crossed timbers which grew on the eastern border of our ranch lands. Taking two pack mules and Trebusio as cook, a party of eight of us rode away expecting to remain overnight. Uncle Lance knew of a fine camping spot about ten miles from the ranch. When within a few miles of the place, Trebusio was sent on ahead with the pack mules to make camp. Boys, we'll divide up here, said Uncle Lance, and take a little scout through these cross timbers and try and locate some roosts. The camp will be in those narrows ahead yonder, where the burnt timber is to your right. Keep an eye open for javelina signs. They used to be plentiful through here when there was good mast. Now, scatter out in pairs, and if you can knock down a gobbler or two, we'll have a turkey baked tonight. Dan Happersat knew the camping spot, so I went with him, 
and together we took a big circle through the Ensenal, keeping alert for game signs. Before we had gone far, evidence became plentiful, not only of turkeys, but of peccary and deer. Where the turkeys had recently been scratching, many times we dismounted and led our horses. But either the turkeys were too wary for us, or else we had been deceived as to the freshness of the sign. Several successive shots on our right caused us to hurry out of the timber in the direction of the reports. Halting in the edge of the timber, we watched the strip of prairie between us and the next cover to the south. Soon a flock of fully a hundred wild turkeys came running out of the Ensenal on the opposite side and started to cross to our ridge. Keeping under cover, we rode to intercept them, never losing sight of the covey. They were running fast, but when they were nearly halfway across the opening, there was another shot and they took the flight, sailing in the cover ahead of us, well out of range. But one gobbler was so fat that he was unable to fly over a hundred yards, and was still in the open. We rode to cut him off. On sighting us, he attempted to rise, but his pounds were against him, and when we crossed his course he was so winded that our horses ran all around him. After we had both shot a few times missing him, he squatted in some tall grass and stuck his head under a turf. Dismounting, Dan sprang on to him like a fox, and he was ours. We wrung his neck and agreed to report that we had shot him through the head, thus concealing, in the absence of bullet wounds, our poor marksmanship. When we reached the camp shortly before dark, we found the others had already arrived, ours making the sixth turkey in the evening's bag. We had drawn ours on killing it, as had the others, and after supper, Uncle Lance superintended the stuffing of the two largest birds. While this was in progress, others made a stiff mortar, and we coated each turkey with about three inches of the waxy play, feathers and all. Opening our campfire, we placed the turkeys together, covered them with ashes, and built a heaping fire over and around them. A number of haunts had been located by the others, but as we expected to make an early hunt in the morning, we decided not to visit any of the roosts that night. After Uncle Lance had regaled us with hunting stories of an earlier day, the discussion innocently turned to my recent elopement. By this time the scars had healed fairly well, and I took the chafing in all good humor. Tully told of a personal experience which, if it was the truth, argued that in time I might become as indifferent to my recent mishap as any one could wish. My prospects of marrying a few years ago, said Tully, lying full stretch before the fire, were a whole lot better than yours, Quirk. My ambition those days was to boss a herd up the trail and get top-notch wages. She was a Texas girl just like yours, bred up in Van Zant County. She could ride a horse like an Indian. Bad horses seemed afraid of her. Why, I saw her once, when she was about sixteen, take a black stallion out of his stable. Lead him out with but a rope around his neck, throw a half-hitch about his nose, and mount him as though he were her pet. Bareback and without a bridle, she rode him ten miles for a doctor. There wasn't a mile of the distance either, but he felt the quirt burning in his flank and knew he was being ridden by a master. Her father scolded her at the time and boasted about it later. She had dozens of admirers, and the first impression I ever made on her was when she was about twenty. There was a big tournament being given, and all the young bloods in many counties came in to contest for the prizes. I was a double winner in the games and contests, won a roping prize, and was the only lad that came inside the time limit as a lancer, though several beat me on rings. Of course the tournament ended with a ball. Having won the Lance Prize, it was my privilege of crowning the Queen of the Ball. Of course I wasn't going to throw away such a chance, for there was no end of rivalry amongst the girls over it. The crown was made of flowers, or if there were none in season, of live oak leaves. Well, at the ball after the tournament, 
I crowned Miss Kate with a crown of oak leaves. After that I felt bold enough to crowd matters, and things came my way. We were to be married during Easter week, but her mother upped and died, so we put it off a while for the sake of appearances. The next spring I got a chance to boss a herd up the trail for Jess Ellison. It was the chance of my life, and I couldn't think of refusing. The girl put up quite a mouth about it, and I explained to her that a hundred a month wasn't offered to every man. She finally gave in, but still you could see she wasn't pleased. Girls that way don't sabe cattle matters a little bit. She promised to write me at several points, which I told her the herd would pass. When I bade her good-bye, tears stood in her eyes, though she tried to hide them. I'd have gambled my life on her that morning. Well, we made a nice trip good outfit and strong cattle. Uncle Jess mounted us ten horses to the man, every one fourteen hands or better, for we were contracted for delivery in Nebraska. It was a five-month's drive with scarcely an incident on the way, just a run or two and a dry drive or so. I had lots of time to think about Kate. When we reached the Chisholm Crossing on Red River, I felt certain that I would find the letter, but I didn't. I wrote her from there, but when we reached Caldwell, nearly a letter either. The same luck at Abilene. Try as I might, I couldn't make it out. Something was wrong, but what it was was anybody's guess. At this last place we got our orders to deliver the cattle at the junction of the middle and lower loop. It was a terror of a long drive, but that wasn't a circumstance compared to not hearing from Kate. I kept all this to myself, mind you. When our herd reached its destination, which it did on time, as hard luck would have it, there was a hitch in the payment. The herd was turned loose, and all the outfit but myself sent home. I stayed there two months longer at a little place called Broken Bow. I held the bill of sale for the herd and would turn it over, transferring the cattle from one owner to another on the word from my employer. At last I received a letter from Uncle Jess saying that the payment in full had been made, so I surrendered the final document and came home. Those trains seemed to run awful slow. But I got home all too soon, for she had then been married three months. You see, an agent for eight-day clocks came along, and being a stranger took her eye. He was one of those nice, dapper fellows, wore a red necktie, and could talk all day to a woman. He worked by the rule of three, tickle, talk, and flatter, with a few cutes thrown in for a pelon. That gets nearly any of them. They live in town now. He's a windmill agent. I never went near them. Meanwhile, the fire kept place with a talk, thanks to Uncle Lance's watchful eye. That's right. Tribucio carry up plenty of good Lena, he kept saying. Bring in all the black jack oak that you can find. It makes fine coals. Those are both big gobblers, and to bake them until they fall to pieces like a watermelon will require a steady fire till morning. Pile up a lot of wood, and if I wake during the night, trust me to look after the fire. I've baked so many turkeys this way that I'm an expert at the business. A girl's argument, remarked Dan Happersat, in a lull of talk, doesn't have to be very weighty to fit any case. Anything she does is justifiable. That's one reason why I always kept shy of women. I admit that I've toyed around with some of them, have tossed my tug on one or two just to see if they would run on the rope. But now generally I keep a wire fence between them and myself if they show any symptoms of being on the Mary. Maybe so I was in earnest once, back on the Trinity, but it seems that every time that I made a pass, my loop would foul or fail to open, or there was brush in the way. Just because you have a few gray hairs in your head, you think you're awfully foxy, don't you? said Uncle Lance to Dan. I've seen lots of independent fellows like you. If I had a little widow who knew her cards 
and just let her kitten up to you and act coltish, inside a week you would be following her around like a pet lamb. I knew a fellow, said Nancredi, lighting his pipe with a firebrand, that when the clerk asked him, when he went for a license to marry, if he would swear that the young lady, his intendant, was over twenty-one. Yes, by God, I'll swear that she's over thirty-one. After the next pause in the yarning, I inquired why a wild turkey always deceived itself by hiding its head and leaving the body exposed. That's it a fact we all know, volunteered Uncle Lance, but the why and wherefore is too deep for me. I take it that it's due to running to neck too much in their construction. Now an ostrich is the same way, all neck and not a lick of sense. And the same applies to the human family. You take one of these long-necked cowmen, and what does he know outside of cattle? Nine times out of ten I can tell a sensible girl by merely looking at her neck. Now snicker, you dratted young fools, just as if I wasn't talking horse sense to you. Some of you boys haven't got much more sobby than a fat old gobbler. When I first came to this state, said June DeWeese, who had been quietly and attentively listening to the stories, I stopped over on the Natchez River near a place called Shotabuck Crossing. I had an uncle living there with whom I had made my home the first few years that I lived in Texas. There are more or less cattle there but it's principally a cotton country. There was an old cuss living over there on that river who was land poor, but had a powerful pretty girl. Her old man owned any number of plantations on the river, generally had lots of niggers rented to look after. Miss Sally, the daughter, was the belle of the neighborhood. She had all the graces with a fair mixture of the weaknesses of her sex. The trouble was, there was no young man in the whole country fit to hold her horse. At least she and her folks entertained that idea. There was a storekeeper and a young doctor at the county seat, who it seems took turns calling on her. It looked like it was going to be a close race. Outside of these two, there wasn't a one of us who could touch her with a twenty-four-foot fish pole. We simply took the side of the road when she passed by. About this time there drifted in from out west near Fort McCavitt a young fellow named Curly Thorne. He had relatives living in that neighborhood. Out at the fort he was a common foreman on a ranch. Talk about your graceful riders. He sat a horse in the manner that left nothing to be desired. Well, Curly made himself very agreeable with all the girls on the range, but played no special favorites. He stayed in the country, visiting among cousins until camp meeting began over at the Alabama campground. During this meeting, Curly proved himself quite a gallant by carrying first one young lady and the next evening some other to camp meeting. During these two weeks of the meeting, someone introduced him to Miss Sally. Now remember, he didn't play her for a favorite no more than any other. That's what miffed her. She thought he ought to. One Sunday afternoon she intimated to him, like a girl sometimes will, that she was going home and was sorry that she had no companion for the ride. This was sufficient for the gallant Curly to offer himself to her as an escort. She simply thought she was stealing a bow from some other girl, and he never dreamt he was dallying with Natchez River royalty. But the only inequality in that couple, as they rode away from the ground, was an erroneous idea in her and her folks' minds. And that difference was in the fact that her old dad had more land than he could pay taxes on. Well, Curly not only saw her home, but stayed for tea. That's the name girls sat for supper over there on the Natchez. And that night carried her back to the evening service. From that day to the close of the session, he was devotedly hers. A month afterward, when he left, it was the talk of the country that they were to be married during the coming holidays. But then there were the young doctor and the storekeeper still in the game. Curly was off the scene temporarily, 
but the other two were riding their best horses to a shadow. Miss Sally's folks were pulling like bay steers for the merchant, who had some money. While the young doctor had nothing but empty pill bags and a saddle horse or two. The doctor was the better looking, and before meeting Curly Torn, Miss Sally had favored him. Knowing one said they were engaged, but near the close of the race, there was sufficient home influence used for the storekeeper to take the lead and hold it until the showdown came. Her folks announced the wedding, and the merchant received the best wishes of his friends, while the young doctor took a trip for his health. Well, it developed afterwards that she was engaged to both the storekeeper and the doctor at the same time. But that's nothing. My experience tells me that a girl don't need broad shoulders to carry three or four engagements at the same time. Well, within a week of the wedding, who should drift in to spend Christmas but Curly Thorn? His cousins, of course, lost no time in giving him the lay of the land. But Curly acted indifferent, and never even offered to call on Miss Sally. Us fellows joked him about his girl going to marry another fellow, and he didn't seem a little bit put out. In fact, he seemed to enjoy the sudden turn as a good joke on himself. But one morning, two days before the wedding was to take place, Miss Sally was missing from her home, as was likewise Curly Torn from the neighborhood. Yes, Thorn had eloped with her, and they were married the next morning in Nacogdoches. And the funny thing about it was Curly never met her after his return until the night they eloped. But he had a girl cousin who had a finger in the pie. She and Miss Sally were as thick as three in a bed, and Curly didn't have anything to do but play the hand that was dealt him. Before I came to Las Palomas, I was over around Fort McCavitt and met Curly. We knew each other, and he took me home and had me stay overnight with him. They had been married then four years. She had a baby on each knee and another in her arms. There was so much reality in life that she had no time to become a dreamer. Matrimony in that case was a good leveler of imaginary rank. I always admired Curly for the indifferent hand he played all through the various stages of the courtship. He never knew there was such a thing as difference. He simply coppered the play to win, and the cards came his way. "'Bully for Curly,' said Uncle Lance, arising and fixing the fire as the rest of us unrolled our blankets. If some of my rascals could make ten strikes like that, it would break a streak of bad luck which has overshadowed Las Palomas for over thirty years. Great Scott, but those gobblers smell good. I can hear them blubbering and sizzling in their shells. It will surely take an axe to crack that clay in the morning. But get under your blankets, lads, for I'll call you for a turkey breakfast about dawn. End of chapter 11、chapter、Twelve of A Texas Matchmaker by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Summer of seventy seven. During our trip into Mexico the fall before, DeWeese contracted for three thousand cows at two haciendas on the Rio San Juan. Early in the spring, June and I returned to receive the cattle. The ranch outfit under Uncle Lance was to follow some three weeks later and camp on the American side at Roma, Texas. We made arrangements as we crossed into Mexico with a mercantile house in Mir to act as our bankers, depositing our own drafts and taking letters of credit to the interior. In buying the cows, We had designated Mir, which was just opposite Roma, as the place for settlement, and Uncle Lance, on his arrival, brought drafts to cover our purchases, depositing them with the same merchant. On receiving, we used a tally mark, which served as a road brand, thus preventing a second branding, and throughout, much to the disgust of the Mexican vaqueros, Deweese enforced every humane idea. Which Nancredi had practiced the spring before in accepting the trail herd at Las Palomas. 
There were endless quantities of stock cattle to select from on the two haciendas, and when ready to start under the specifications, a finer lot of cows would have been hard to find. The worst drawback was that they were constantly dropping calves on the road, and before we reached the river we had a calf wagon in regular use. On arriving at the Rio Grande, the then stage of water was fortunately low, and we crossed the herd without a halt, the import papers having been attended to in advance. Uncle Lance believed in plenty of help, and had brought down from Las Palomas an ample outfit of men and horses. He had also anticipated the dropping of calves, and had rigged up a carrier, the box of which was open framework. Thus, until a calf was strong enough to follow, the mother, as she trailed along beside the wagon, could keep an eye on her offspring. We made good drives the first two or three days, but after clearing the first bottoms of the Rio Grande, and on reaching the tablelands, we made easy stages of ten to twelve miles a day. When near enough to calculate on our arrival at Las Palomas, the old ranchero quit us and went into the ranch. Several days later a vaquero met the herd about thirty miles south of Santa Maria, and brought the information that the Valverde outfit was at the ranch, and instructions to veer westward and drive down the Ganso on approaching the Nueces. By these orders, the delivery on the home river would occur at least twenty miles west of the ranch headquarters. As we were passing to the westward of Santa Maria, our employer and one of the buyers rode out from that ranch and met the herd. They had decided not to brand until arriving at their destination on the Devil's River which would take them at least a month longer. While this deviation was nothing to us, it was a gain to them. The purchaser was delighted with the cattle and our handling of them, there being fully a thousand young calves, and on reaching their camp on the Gonzo, the delivery was completed, four days in advance of the specified time. For fear of losses, we had received a few head extra and on counting them over, found we had not lost a single hoof. The buyers received the extra cattle, and the delivery was satisfactorily concluded. One of the partners returned with us to Las Palomas for the final settlement, while the other, taking charge of the herd, turned them up to new aces. The receiving outfit had fourteen men and some hundred and odd horses. Aside from their commissary, they also had a calf wagon, drawn by two yoke of oxen and driven by a strapping big negro. In view of the big calf crop, the partners concluded that an extra conveyance would not be amiss, and on Uncle Lance making them a reasonable figure, on our calf wagon and four mules drawing it, they never changed a word but took the outfit. As it was late in the day when the delivery was made, the double outfit remained in the same camp that night and with the best wishes, bade each other farewell in the morning. Nearly a month had passed since Deweese and I had left Las Palomas for the Rio San Juan, and, returning with the herd, had met our own outfit at the Rio Grande. During the interim, before the ranch outfit had started, the long-talked-of tournament on the Nueces had finally been arranged. The date had been set for the 5th of June and all of the home news which the outfit brought down to the Rio Grande, none was as welcome as this. According to the program, the contests were to include riding, roping, relay races, and handling the lance. Several of us had never witnessed a tournament, but as far as roping and riding were concerned, we all considered ourselves past masters of the arts. The relay race was simple enough, and Dan Happersat volunteered this explanation of the lance contest to those of us who were uninitiated. Well, said Dan, while we're riding home from the Gonzo, a straight track is laid off about two hundred yards long. About every forty yards there's a post set up along the line with an arm reaching out over the track. From this there is suspended an iron ring about two inches in diameter. The contestant is armed with a wooden lance of regulation length, 
and as he rides down this track at full speed, and within a time limit, he is to impale as many of these rings as possible. Each contestant is entitled to three trials, and the one impaling the most rings is declared the victor. That's about all there is to it, except the award. The festivities, of course, close with a dance, in which the winner crowns the queen of the ball. That's the reason the girls always take such an interest in the lancing, because the winner has the choosing of his queen. I won it once, over on the Trinity, and chose a little cribble girl. Had to do it or leave the country, for it was looked upon as an engagement to marry. Oh, I tell you, if a girl is sweet on a fellow, it's a mighty strong card to play. Before starting for the Rio Grande, the old ranchero had worked our horse stock, forming fourteen new manadas, so that on our return, about the only work which could command our attention was the breaking of more saddle horses. We had gentled two hundred the spring before, and breaking a hundred and fifty now, together with the old remudas, would give Las Palomas fully five hundred saddle horses. The ranch had the geldings, the men had time, and there was no good excuse for not gentling more horses. So after a few days' rest, the oldest and heaviest geldings were gathered, and we then settled down to routine horsework. But not even this exciting employment could keep the coming tournament from our minds. Within a week after returning to the ranch, we had laid off a lancing course, and during every spare hour, the Knights of Las Palomas might be seen galloping over the course, practicing. I tried using the lance several times, only to find that it was not as easy as it looked, and I finally gave up the idea of lancing honors, and turned my attention to the relay races. Miss Jean had been the only representative of our ranch at Shepherd's on San Jacinto Day but she had had her eyes open on that occasion, and on our return had a message for nearly every one of us. I was not expecting any, still the mistress of Las Palomas had met my old sweetheart and her sister, Mrs. Hunter, at the ferry, and the three had talked the matter over and mingled their tears in mutual sympathy. I made a blustering talk, which was to cover my real feelings, and to show that I had grown indifferent towards Esther. But that tactful woman had not lived in vain, and read me aright. Tom, said she, I was a young woman when you were a baby. There are lots of things in which you might deceive me, but Esther McLeod is not one of them. You loved her once, and you can't tell me that in less than a year you have forgotten her. I won't say that men forget easier than women, but you have never suffered one-tenth the heartaches over Esther McLeod that she has over you. You can afford to be generous with her, Tom. True, she allowed an older sister to browbeat and bully her into marrying another man. But she was an inexperienced girl then. If you were honest, you would admit that Esther, of her own accord, would never have married Jack Oxenford. Then why punish the innocent? Oh, Tom, if you could only see her now. Sorrow and suffering have developed the woman in her, and she is no longer the girl you knew and loved. Miss Jean was hewing too close to the line for my comfort. Her observations were so near the truth that they touched me in a vulnerable spot. Yet as I paced the room, I expressed myself emphatically as never wishing to meet Esther McLeod again. I really felt that way but I had not reckoned on the mistress of Las Palomas, nor considered that her strong sympathy for my former sweetheart had moved her to more than ordinary endeavor. The month of May passed. Uncle Lance spent several weeks at the Booth Ranch on the Frio. At the home ranch, practice for the contests went forward with vigor. By the first of June, we had sifted the candidates down until we had determined our best men for each entry. The old ranchero and our segundo, together with Dan Happersat, made up a good set of judges on our special fitness for the different contests, and we were finally picked in this order. Enrique Lopez was to rope, Pascual Arispe was to ride, to Theodore Quayle 
fell the chance of handling the lance, while I, being young and nimble on my feet, was decided on as the rider in the ten-mile relay race. In this contest I was fortunate in having the pick of over three hundred and fifty saddle horses. They were the accumulation of years of the best that Las Palomas bred, and it was almost bewildering to make the final selection. But in this I had the benefit of the home judges, and when the latter differed on the speed of a horse, a trial usually settled the point. June DeWeese proved to be the best judge of the ranch horses, yet Uncle Lance never yielded his opinion without a test of speed. When the horses were finally decided on, we staked off a half-mile circular track on the first bottom of the river, and every evening the horses were sent over the course. Under the conditions, a contestant was entitled to use as many horses as he wished, but must change mounts at least twenty times in riding the ten miles, and must finish under a time limit of twenty-five minutes. Out of our abundance we decided to use ten mounts, thus allotting each horse two dashes of a half a mile with the rest between. The horse-breaking ended a few days before the appointed time. Las Palomas stood on the tiptoe of expectancy over the coming tourney. Even Miss Jean rode, having a gentle saddle horse caught up for her use, and taking daily rides about the ranch to witness the practice, for she was as deeply interested as any of us in the forthcoming contests. Born to the soil of Texas, she was a horsewoman of no ordinary ability, and rode like a veteran. On the appointed day, Las Palomas was abandoned, even the Mexican contingent joining in the exodus for shepherds, and only a few old servants remaining at the ranch. As usual, Miss Jean started by ambulance the afternoon before, taking along a horse for her own saddle. The white element and the vaqueros made an early start, driving a remuda of thirty loose horses, several of which were outlaws and a bell mare. They were the picked horses of the ranch, those which we expected to use in the contests, and a change of mounts for the entire outfit on reaching the martial field. We had herded the horses the night before, and the vaqueros were halfway to the ferry when we overtook them. Uncle Lance was with us, and in the height of his glory, in one breath bragging on Enrique and Pasquale, and admonishing and cautioning Theodore and myself in the next. On nearing Shepherd's, Uncle Lance preceded us to hunt up the committee and enter a man from Las Palomas for each of the contests. The ground had been well chosen, a large open bottom on the north side of the river and about a mile above the ferry. The lancing course was laid off. Temporary corrals had been built to hold about thirty range cattle for the roping, and an equal number of outlaw horses for the riding contests. At the upper end of the valley, a half-mile circular race course had been staked off. Throwing our outlaws into the corral and leaving the remuda in charge of two vaqueros, we galloped into Shepherd's with the gathering crowd. From all indications, this would be a red-lettered day at the ferry, for the attendants drained a section of the country fully a hundred miles in diameter. On the north from Campbellton, on the Atascosa, to San Patricio, on the home river to the south, and from the Blanco on the east, to well up the Frio and San Miguel on the west, horsemen were flocking by platoons. I did not know one man in twenty, but Deweese greeted them all as if they were near neighbors. Later in the morning, conveyances began to arrive from Oakville and nearby points, and the presence of women lent variety to the scene. Under the rules, all entries were to be made before ten o'clock. The contests were due to begin a half hour later, and each contestant was expected to be ready to compete in the order of his application. There were eight entries in the relay race all told, mine being the seventh which gave me a good opportunity to study the riding of those who preceded me. There were ten or twelve entries each in the roping and riding contests, while the Knights of the Lance numbered an even thirty. On account of the large number of entries, 
the contest would require a full day, running three classes simultaneously, allowing a slight intermission for lunch. The selection of disinterested judges for each class slightly delayed the commencement. After changing horses on reaching the field, the contest with the lance opened with a lad from Ramanera, who galloped over the course and got but a single ring. From the lateness of our entries, none of us would be called until afternoon, and we wandered at will from one section of the field to another. Red Ernest from Waz Ranch on the Frio was the first entry in the relay race. He had a good mount of eight Spanish horses, which he rode bareback, making many of his changes in less than fifteen seconds apiece, and finishing full three minutes under the time limit. The feat was cheered to the echo. I joined in with the rest, and numerous friendly bets were made that the time would not be lowered that day. Two other riders rode before the noon recess, only one of whom came under the time limit, and his time was a minute over Ernest's record. Miss Jean had camped the ambulance in sight of the field, and kept open house to all comers. Suspecting that she would have Mrs. Hunter and Esther for lunch, if they were present, I avoided our party and took dinner with Mrs. Booth. Meanwhile, Uncle Lance detailed DeWeese and Happersett to handle my horses, allowing us five vaqueros and distributing the other men as assistants to our other three contestants. The day was an ideal one for contest, rather warm during the morning, but tempered later by a fine afternoon breeze. It was after four o'clock when I was called, with Waugh's man still in the lead. Forming a small circle at the starting point, each of our vaqueros led a pair of our horses and bridles only around the ring, constantly having in hand eight of my mount of ten. As handlers, I had two good men in our segundo and Dan Happersack. I crossed the line amid the usual shouting with a running start, determined, if possible, to lower the record of Red Ernest. In making the changes, all I asked was a good grip on the mane, and I found my seat as the horse shot away. The horses had broken into an easy sweat before the race began, and having stripped to the lowest possible ounce of clothing, I felt that I was getting out of them every fraction of speed they possessed. The ninth horse in my mount, a roan, for some unknown reason sulked at starting, then bolted out on the prairie, but got away with the loss of only about ten seconds, running the half-mile like a scared wolf. Until it came the roan's turn to go again, no untoward incident happened, friendly timekeepers posting me at every change of mounts. But when this bolter's turn came again, he reared and plunged away, stiff-legged, crossed the inward furrow, and before I could turn him again to the track, cut inside the course for two stakes, or possibly fifty yards. By this time I was beyond recall, but as I came round and passed the starting point, the judges attempted to stop me, and I well knew my chances were over. Uncle Lance promptly waived all rights to the award, and I was allowed to finish the race, lowering Ernest's time over twenty seconds. The eighth contestant, so I learned later, barely came under the time limit. The vaqueros took charge of the relay mounts, and, reinvesting myself in my discarded clothing, I mounted my horse to leave the field, when who should gallop up and extend sympathy and congratulations but Miss Jean and my old sweetheart. There was no avoiding them, and discourtesy to the mistress of Las Palomas being out of the question, I greeted Esther with an affected warmth and cordiality. As I released her hand, I could not help noticing how she had saddened into a serious woman, while the gentleness in her voice condemned me for my attitude toward her. But Miss Jean artfully gave us little time for embarrassment, inviting me to show them the unconcluded program. From contest to contest we rode the field until the sun went down and the trials ended. It was my first tournament, and nothing escaped my notice. There were fully 150 women and girls, and possibly double that number of men, old and young, 
everyone mounted and galloping from one point of the field to another. Blushing maidens and their swains dropped out of the throng, and from shady vantage points watched the crowd surge back and forth across the field of action. We were sorry to miss Enrique's roping, for having snapped his saddle horn with the first cast, he recovered his rope, fastened it to the fork of his saddle tree, and tied his steer in fifty-four seconds, or within ten of the winner's record. When he apologized to Miss Jean for his bad luck, hat in hand, and his eyes as big as saucers, one would have supposed that he had brought lasting disgrace on Las Palomas. We were more fortunate in witnessing Pascal's riding. For this contest, outlaws and spoiled horses had been collected from every quarter. Riders drew their mounts by lot, and Pascal drew a cinnamon-colored coyote from the ranch of Uncle Nate Wilson of Ramanera. Uncle Nate was feeling a fine fettle, and when he learned that his contribution to the outlaw horses had been drawn by a Las Palomas man, he hunted up the ranchero. I'll bet you a new five-dollar hat that that cinnamon horse throws your vaquero so high that birds build nests in his crotch before he hits the ground. Uncle Lance took the bet and disdainfully ran his eye up and down his old friend, finally remarking, Nate, you ought to keep perfectly sober on occasions like this. You're liable to lose all your money. Pascal was a shallow-brained, clownish fellow, and after saddling up, as he led the coyote into the open to mount, he imitated a drunken vaquero. Tipsily admonishing the horse in Spanish to behave himself, he vaulted into the saddle and clouded his mount over the head with his hat. The coyote resorted to every ruse known to a bucking horse to unseat his rider. In the midst of which Pascal, languidly lolling in his saddle, took a small bottle from his pocket, and drinking its contents, tossed it backward over his head. "'Look at that, Nate,' said Uncle Lance, slapping Mr. Wilson with his hat. "'That's one of Las Palomas's vaqueros, bred with just enough sense to ride anything that wears hair.' We'll look at those new hats this evening. In the fancy riding which followed, Pascal did a number of stunts. He picked up hat and handkerchief from the ground at full speed, and likewise gathered up silver dollars from alternate sides of his horse as the animal sped over a short course. Stripping off his saddle and bridle, he rode the naked horse with the grace of an Indian, and but for his clownish indifference, and the apparent ease in which he did things, the judges might have taken his work more seriously. As it was, our outfit and those friendly to our ranch were proud of his performance. But among outsiders, and even the judges, it was generally believed that he was tipsy, which was an injustice to him. On the conclusion of the contest with the lance, among the thirty participants, four were tied on honors one of whom was Theodore Quayle. The other contest being over, the crowd gathered round the lancing course, excitement being at its highest pitch. A lad from the Blanco was the first called on for the finals, and after three efforts failed to make good his former trial. Quayle was the next called, and as he sped down the course, my heart stood still for a moment. But as he returned, holding high his lance, Five rings were impaled upon it. He was entitled to two more trials, but rested on his record until it was tied or beaten, and the next man was called. Forcing her way through the crowded field, Miss Jean warmly congratulated Theodore, leaving Esther to my tender care. But at this juncture my old sweetheart caught sight of Francis Vox and some gallant approaching from the river shade. Together we galloped out to meet them. Mrs. Vaux's escort was a neighbor lad from the Frio, but both he and I, for the time being, were relegated to oblivion. In the prospects of a Las Palomas man by the name of Quayle, winning the lancing contest, Miss Frances, with a shrug, was for denying all interest in the result, but Esther and I doubled on her, forcing her to admit that it would be real nice if Teddy should win. I never was so aggravated over the indifference of a girl in my life, and my regard for my former sweetheart, 
on account of her enthusiasm for a Las Palomas lad, kindled anew within me. But as the third man sped over the course, we hastily returned to watch the final results. After a last trial, the man threw down his lance, and, riding up, congratulated Quail. The last contestant was a red-headed fellow from the Atascosa above Oakville, and seemed to have a host of friends. On his first trial over the course, he stripped four rings, but on neither subsequent effort did he equal his first attempt. Imitating the former contestant, the red-headed fellow broke his lance and congratulated the winner. The tourney was over. Esther and I urged Miss Frances to ride over with us and congratulate Quail. She demurred, but as the crowd scattered I caught Theodore's eye, and signaling to him, he rode out of the crowd and joined us. The compliments of Miss Vox to the winner were insipid and lifeless, while Esther, as if to atone for her friend's lack of interest, beamed with happiness over Quail's good luck. Poor Teddy hardly knew which way to turn, and, nice girl as she was, I almost hated Miss Frances for her indifferent attitude. A plain, blunt fellow, though he was, Quail had noticed the coolness in the greeting of the young lady, whom he had no doubt had had in mind for months, in case he should win the privilege to crown his queen of the ball. Picked and unsettled in his mind, he excused himself on some trivial pretense and withdrew. Everyone was scattering to the picnic grounds for supper, and under the pretense of escorting Esther to the Vox conveyance, I accompanied the young ladies. Managing to fall to the rear of Miss Frances and her gallant for the day, I bluntly asked my old sweetheart if she understood the attitude of her friend. For reply, she gave me a pitying glance, saying, Oh, you boys know so little about a girl. You see that Teddy chooses Francis for his queen tonight, and leave the rest to me. On reaching their picnic camp, I excused myself, promising to meet them later at the dance, and rode over to our ambulance. Tribucio had supper all ready, and after it was over, I called Theodore to one side and repeated Esther's message. Quail was still doubtful, and I called Miss Jean to my assistance, hoping to convince him that Miss Vox was not unfriendly towards him. "'You always want to judge a woman by contrary,' said Miss Jean, seating herself on a log beside us. "'When it comes to acting her part, always depend on a girl to conceal her true feelings, especially if she has tact. Now, from what you boys say, my judgment is that she'll cry her eyes out if any other girl was chosen queen.' Uncle Lance had promised Mr. Wilson to take supper with his family, and as we were all sprucing up for the dance, he returned. He had not been present at the finals for the lancing contest, but from guests of the Wilsons had learned that one of his boys had won the honors. So on riding into camp, as the finishing touches were being added to our rustic toilets, he accosted Quail and said, Well, Theo, they tell me that you won the elephant. Great Scott, boy, that's the best luck that has struck Las Palomas since the big rain a year ago this month. Of course, we all understand that you'll choose the oldest Vox girl. What's that? You don't know? Well, I do. I had that all planned out, in case you won. Ever since we decided that you was to contest as the representative of Las Palomas. And now you want to balk, do you? Uncle Lance was showing some spirit but his sister checked him with this explanation. Just because Miss Frances didn't show any enthusiasm over Theo winning, he and Tom somehow have got the idea in their minds that she don't care a rap to be chosen queen. I've tried to explain it to them, but the boys don't understand girls, that's all. Why, if Theo were to choose any other girl, she'd set the river afire. That's it, is it? snorted Uncle Lance pulling his gray mustaches. Well, I've known for some time that Tom didn't have good sense, but I've always given you, Theo, credit for having a little. I'll gamble my all that what Jean says is Bible truth. Didn't I have my eye on you and that girl nearly a week 
during the hunt a year ago? And haven't you been riding my horse over to the Frio once or twice a month ever since? You can read a brand as far as I can, but I can see that you're as blind as a bat about a girl. Now, young fellow, listen to me. When the Master of Ceremonies announces the winners of the day, and your name is called, throw out your brisket, stand straight on those bow legs of yours, step forward and claim your privilege. When the wreath is tendered you, accept it, carry it to the lady of your choice, and kneeling before her, if she bids you arise, place the crown on her brow, and lead the grand march. I'd gladly give Las Palomas and every hoof on it for your years and a chance. The festivities began with falling darkness. The master of ceremonies, a schoolteacher from Oakville, read out the successful contestants and the prizes to which they were entitled. The name of Theodore Quayle was the last to be called, and excusing himself to Miss Jean, who had him in tow, he walked forward with a military air, executing every movement in the ceremony like an actor. As the music struck up, he and the blushing Francis Vaux, rare in rustic beauty and crowned with a wreath of live oak leaves, led the opening march. Hundreds of hands clapped in approval, and as the applause quieted down, I turned to look for a partner, only to meet Miss Jean and my former sweetheart. Both were in a seventh heaven of delight, and promptly took occasion to remind me of my lack of foresight, repeating in chorus, didn't I tell you? But the music had broken into a waltz, which precluded any argument, and on the mistress's remarking, you young folks are missing a fine dance, involuntarily, my arm encircled my old sweetheart, and we drifted away into Elysian fields. The night after the first tournament at Shepherd's on the Nueces in June 77 lingers as a pleasant memory. Veiled in hazy retrospect, attempting to recall it, is like inviting the return of a childish dream when one has reached the years of maturity. If I danced that night with any other girl than poor Esther McLeod, the fact has certainly escaped me. But somewhere in the archives of memory, there is an indelible picture of a stroll through dimly lighted picnic grounds, of sitting on a rustic set tea built around the base of a patriarchal live oak, and listening to a broken-hearted woman lay bare the sorrows which less than a year had brought her. I distinctly recall that my eyes, though unused to weeping, filled with tears, when Esther, in words of deepest sorrow and contrition, begged me to forgive her heedless and reckless act. Could I harbor resentment in the face of such entreaty? The impulsiveness of youth refused to believe that true happiness had gone out of her life. She was again to me as she had been before her unfortunate marriage, and must be released from the hateful bonds that bound her. Firm in this resolve, dawn stole upon us, still sitting at the root of the old oak. Oblivious and happy in each other's presence, having pledged anew our troth for time and eternity. With the breaking of day, the revelers dispersed. Quite a large contingent from those present rode several miles up the river with our party. The Remuda had been sent home the evening before with the returning vaqueros, while the impatience of the ambulance mules frequently carried them in advance of the cavalcade. The mistress of Las Palomas had as her guest returning Miss Julie Wilson, and the first time they passed us, some four or five miles above the ferry, I noticed Uncle Lance ride up, swaggering in his saddle, and poke Glen Gallup in the ribs with a wink and a nod toward the conveyance as the mules dashed past. The pace we were traveling would carry us home by the middle of the forenoon, and once we were reduced to the home crowd, the old matchmaker broke out enthusiastically. This tourney was what I call a success. I don't care a tinker's darn for the prizes, but the way you boys built up to the girls last night warmed the sluggish blood in my old veins, even if Cotton did claim a dance or two with the oldest Vox girl. If Theo and her don't make the riffle now, well, they simply can't help it, having gone so far. And did any of you notice Scales and old June and Dan cutting the pigeon wings like colts? 
I reckon Quirk will have to make some new resolutions this morning. Oh, I heard about your declaring that you never wanted to see Esther McLeod again. That's all right, son, but hereafter remember that a resolve about a woman is only good for the day it is made, or until you meet her. And notice, will you, ahead, yonder, that sister of mine playing second fiddle as a matchmaker. Glenn, if I was you, the next time Miss Jewel looks back this way, I'd play sick, and maybe they'd let you ride in the ambulance. I can see at a glance that she's being poorly entertained. End of chapter 12